The process of turning a three-dimensional scene into a two-dimensional image or movie is known as rendering. So we've been working in our 3D view, but if we actually wanted to get this out of Blender so that we could share it with somebody else, of course we could screenshot Blender, but of course there's a much better way to do that. We can render an image just by going to the render menu and choosing render image, or using the hotkey F12. Now we get to see our cube in all its glory. To save this out, just go to image and choose save as. Navigate to wherever you want to save it to. Choose the file format, though I'd recommend sticking with PNG if you're just starting out. Give this a name and click save. Then you'll be able to open it up in any photo viewer. One thing you might have noticed though is that the angle that we rendered from is different than what we currently see in our viewport. That's because rendering always happens from the active camera, which is this guy right here. We can see what our camera sees if we click on the camera icon in the navigation gizmos, and now it matches up perfectly one to one. If you want to transform your camera from within camera view, then you can either click on the edge, just like so, or select your camera in the outliner, hit G to grab, or R to rotate. Though I recommend mostly rotating on the Z axis, I'll hit Z to go to the global Z axis, or even better, you can switch to local orientation, rotate this around the X axis, the Y axis, or when you hit G and then Z, move it along its local Z axis in order to zoom it in or out. I've always thought this to be a bit of a confusing choice, but if we go to our move tool and look at our camera's local orientation, the Z axis is pointing straight through the camera. Regardless, you can also always jump into your camera by hitting zero on the number pad. And if you don't want to transform your camera in the way that I just showed, you can also lock it to your view so that you can navigate as normal. To do that, go to your sidebar, down to the view tab, and turn on lock camera to view. Now when you navigate as you would normally, your camera follows along. Just be sure to turn this off when you're done, otherwise you might accidentally bump your camera position. Also in the view tab, you'll have your focal length and your clip start and end. Though your focal length is currently grayed out. To get to that, go to your camera data properties and change that here. This clip start and end is how close something can be to the camera or how far away it can be before it starts to disappear. Because if we get our camera really, really close to an object, for example, I'll hit G and Z until I zoom really close in, at some point I'm going to poke through the side of the cube. Currently, I must be exactly 0.1 meters from the cube. But if I set this to something smaller, like 0.01, then I can get even closer without that clipping. Similarly, if I zoom out really, really far, eventually I'm not going to be able to see the cube at all, and I'm going to have to increase this distance in order to see everything. What beginners sometimes do is set the start to something incredibly small and the end to something absolutely massive, but that can actually cause a lot of problems, so I'd actually recommend keeping the distance between these as small as possible. To explain this, I'll also show you how it affects the 3D view. To change the clip start or end, for the 3D view that I see when I'm not in camera view, I can change that up here in the view tab. Here's the reason I don't want to set this to extreme values. If I take my cube and I hit shift D, such that there are two cubes directly on top of each other, and let's just color them differently by going to the solid shaded view dropdown and setting that to random, then at some point we're going to get a little bit of a glitchy artifact. Though if they're 100% directly on top of each other, maybe this won't happen. So what I'll do is I'll hit S and just scale one slightly up. Now as I zoom out, then you'll see the glitch that I'm talking about. As I zoom around, you can tell that Blender's not quite sure which one to display over the other one. This artifact is called Z-fighting, and the farther apart that these values are, the worse your Z-fighting is going to be, and the more that you're going to see it. So if I were to set these to really extreme values, then your scene is going to become absolutely unusable. So if you start to see weird artifacts like this, the first thing to check is your clip start and end. And if you can't zoom in enough to something, or you can't see something that's too far away, then again, the solution is to check your clip settings. Just remember that they're different for the viewport and your camera. Now I'll delete my extra cube here, and let's look at what happens if I have two cameras. I'll take my first camera, hit Shift D, and duplicate it over. Now this camera has a filled in triangle on top, and this one does not, which indicates that this camera is the active camera. So when I render, it'll always happen from this camera. To change that, head to the scene properties which is the tab in the properties editor that looks like a cone, a sphere, and a dot. Up at the very top, we have a camera selector. So I can switch which camera is active here, and that'll be the one that's used for rendering. If you'd like to do that with a hotkey, simply select your other camera and hit Control-0 on the number pad. That will jump you into the camera, but also set it as active. 
Now, the weird thing is, is that you can do this for objects that aren't cameras. For example, I just did that to this cube, or you could do this to this light, and it sets it as the active camera for the scene, which really makes absolutely no sense. I don't know why Blender does this, but sometimes people accidentally hit control zero on things that aren't cameras, and it causes a lot of confusion. So if something like that happens, check your scene properties, or just select your camera and hit control zero to reset it. Next, let's talk about rendering. Blender has three different methods that you can use for rendering your scene, and one of them is happening all the time in the 3D viewport. Of course, it has to have some way of representing the 3D geometry as a 2D image in order to send it to your screen. So the viewport is constantly rendering all of the time. It just happens to be a very fast and efficient renderer, which is made specifically for real-time interaction. This render engine is called Workbench, and it's what we see when we go into wireframe view or solid view. We can change the settings over in the viewport shading menu which is where we already looked at setting things like how our objects get colored. But if you want, you can also render out using Workbench. The first way is to just get whatever's in your viewport out into an image. To do that, instead of just screen capping, you can go to View and Viewport Render Image. But you can also change what happens when you go to Render and Render Image if you go to the Render Properties, which is the tab in the Properties Editor that looks like the back of a camera. Here, let's switch the render engine from EV to Workbench. Now we see all the same settings that we had at the top of the 3D viewport, but if we change one of these settings, then nothing happens. That's because right now we're in solid view, which always has its own settings, but we can also switch over to rendered view, and now we'll see any change that we make updated in our viewport. So we could set this to be a different lighting setup or turn on things like shadows. Now when we hit F12 to render, this is exactly what we're going to see. Though this isn't a particularly interesting result, so while it can be useful sometimes, most of the time you're probably going to want to work with one of the more advanced render engines. The next one we'll look at is Cycles. When you switch to Cycles and you're in rendered view, then you'll see a pretty realistic representation of your scene. Cycles is what's known as a path tracer, which means that it ray traces from every pixel on your screen, and each one of those traces, also called samples, is a little bit random. And so it does that hundreds of times and averages out the result. This means that it starts out noisy, but then gets more refined over time. This is going to be slower to render than anything real time, but it's also going to look incredibly realistic and pleasing right out of the box. By default, Cycles is set to use your CPU for rendering. Even if your computer isn't super new, your CPU can probably handle a lot of geometry and textures, but it might not be that fast at it. So as long as your scenes aren't too heavy, you can often switch from CPU to GPU rendering. This won't be able to render out as big of scenes, but I've been able to use it for most of my projects, and it's way faster. If you don't see this option here though, you can go to your preferences in edit and preferences or use the hotkey control comma, go to the system settings and go up to cycles render devices. Here you'll be able to go through the different rendering APIs and see which ones your computer supports. Make sure your device is checked here and then you'll be good to go. Now let's switch our render engine from cycles to EV. EV is a real time render engine that works similar to a game engine. You'll notice that we have a result that's similar to cycles, but we get that result instantaneously. The reason EV can be so fast though is because it makes a lot of assumptions and approximates the effects through clever trickery. What this means is that it might take a lot of manual tweaking of those tricks in order for it to look good. Whereas Cycle simulates the light very realistically, and so it's going to look good out of the box. You can see here that we're not getting that nice bounce lighting, and our shadow seems to be a little bit off. Now future versions of EV like EV Next will work better out of the box, but just fundamentally, you can expect that any real-time render engine is going to need more manual tweaking of settings than a path tracer. However, the payoff is that you get to render really, really fast. So both engines are incredibly helpful and powerful, and I use both just depending on the type of project. There's also one other shading mode that I haven't mentioned yet, which is Material Preview. This one is always going to use EV, regardless of whether you're in EV or Cycles. It takes away all the fancy shadows and reflections and such, and just gives us a quick preview so we can edit our materials, which is exactly what we're going to look at in the next lesson. Before I let you go though, we should talk about how to change the properties of your output image. For that, you'll want to go to the Output Properties, which is this icon that looks like a printer. Here you'll be able to change things like the resolution, the frame rate of your animations, and how long your animations go for. You can also set the default file format here in the Output Settings, as well as a path for where your animations are going to be saved. If you just save an image, then it won't save it out here. You'll have to do that by going to Save As, just like I showed you before. But whatever you set here will be the default whenever you hit F12, and go to Image and Save. Even if you set the color to RGBA though, with A standing for alpha, which means transparency, you're not going to get a transparent image. Instead, you'll get this exact same gray background. To change that, we actually have to go back to our render properties. 
So if you want to render with transparency, number one, be sure you set this to RGBA, then go to your render properties, again, the back of the camera icon, go down to film, and turn on transparent. Now I'll set this back to Eevee so that this renders faster. Again, in film, transparent is checked, and then I'll hit F12, and we'll get that transparent background. And the last thing that I don't want you to forget about rendering is that which objects get rendered is controlled by the camera icon in the outliner. So if we don't want to render our cube, then we can just uncheck this camera icon and it'll be in our viewport, but not in the render. Now this can often cause confusion if you're not looking for it because maybe something has the eye icon unchecked, but the render icon on. So what's in your viewport is going to look different from what's in your render. So if there's a discrepancy between the two, always check the outliner. Also, don't forget that there's also a monitor icon which is for completely disabling something in the viewport. That might be off as well, so always double check. I know it may seem unnecessarily complicated to have four toggles for just visibility, but as you start working with bigger and bigger scenes with objects that have all different types of purposes, then you'll be really thankful for this organizational flexibility. But for now, I just wanted to show you how you can save your scene out as an image so you can share it with friends and family. It's okay if it's not Pixar quality yet. Your homework for this one is just to make something nice and send it to somebody.